Continuing in our series on this idea of living the God culture, I came up with a word, kind of a, a care, but it's Christian actions res resonating empathy. Christian actions resonating empathy, which means care. God really uh, wants us to care one for another. God really wants to look uh, for us to look beyond ourselves and look to others. And this is the culture not of a Middle Eastern religion or not of a little regional area. I believe this is the culture of God himself, for God so loved the world that he gave. There's something about God that's a giver. And if we represent him, we should be givers. I'm not talking about just money. I'm talking about time, energy, and your love for another. Even your love for those goofy people who call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. You know there can be some goofy people who call themselves Christians? Yeah. Don't point. But I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there are. But that's why. Remember, you, you used to be a goofy guy yourself, and someone came along and said, let me hang out with you for a while. I thank God for those people who came to my life and said, well, let me hang out with you for a while. And I said, but I'm perfect. And I said, we got to deal with that issue right there. <laughs> yeah, we, we have to work. We work with each other. And the idea, that's the heartbeat of God. And it truly is, it's not regional. It's not something of the, of the natural world. It's really supernatural. Now, it's seen in, in most places outside of America. It seems like Americans are funny. Remember back in the 50s when we used to have porches out front? We used to have port buildings, houses used to have porches out front. And people would sit like in a rocking chair and say hello to their neighbors across the street. How's it going, neighbor? And you drive your bicycle and everybody knew who you were on the, on the neighborhood. And you, and you could actually walk to school and everyone would see you walking to school. And you all remember that? Come on. I'm not talking about maybe. Yeah. This is real. This was America back in the day, right? Well, today, what do we do? We go into our gated community, open up our garage door. It goes up. We drive in. It goes back down. And we're like safe. <laughs> no one coming in. No one going out. We're going to just make sure that we know. And it's a very interesting life that we have accepted, and I don't believe that's the culture of God. So I'm going to share something, a story here of, of an unknown tribe in, in the Afghanistan mountains that had a certain process of the way they lived, a certain code of the way they lived. And uh, they're called the Pushtuns. They said in the south, southern half of Afghanistan, there's a tribe called the Pushtuns. They followed an ancient ethic code that deals with hospitality. It's called the code of their life. This is their, their code of their life. Among the many tenets of this particular code is hospitality and forgiveness or asylum. Pashtuns uh, show hospitality and great respect for all visitors, regardless of their race, religion, or national uh, affiliation. They do this without hopes of any payment of favors. They're not doing it to get a favor. They're not doing it for some kind of, you know, this is their code. This is what they, it's been handed down from generation to generation and, and I believe it's a godly code. I believe somewhere along the line they had a, a connection with God and this became part of their DNA. Uh, after a battle with the Taliban, uh, Taliban uh, Luttrell, um, um, Marcus Luttrell managed to crawl miles through enemy territory with a broken back and multiple gunshot wounds with the hopes of finding some, ki some kind of safety. Slowly dying of thirst, he miraculously found a waterfall. As he quenched his thirst, Luttrell found himself surrounded by a group of Afghans men. And now you've been running from the, the Taliban, so you think everyone's a Taliban member. All of a sudden, they come across these group of people, heavily armed, and it's from the Pushtun tribe. And it says that um, Muhammad Ghalab stepped forward, identified himself to Luttrell. He assured him that he and his group were not Taliban, and that they would assist him by taking him back to their village, uh, and they, they gave him food, gave him water, and medical attention, and shelter. Based on their code, they took in an American soldier, and there's a movie called uh, Soul Survivor, and it's about this particular situation. And it was only by their code, and, and these, this particular tribe is loosely affiliated with the Muslim faith. So when the Taliban found out that this tribe had this American, the American that they were looking for, the American that they wounded, they came to him and said, hey, we'll give you some cash to get the American out of your village. And because of their allegiance to their code and their, their faith in their code, they said, no, this, this is who we are. And they said, we're going to, if you don't give it to us, we're going to completely destroy your village. And they said, bring it. Not because of love for America, not because of love for, because of their conviction towards humanity. 
And, the, and, and because of their conviction, they stayed, uh, the Taliban, they kept them away, they fought, and they got this guy back to America. Of course, Mark Luttrell became great friends with this guy <laughs> who basically saved his life and this village. So here's the thing, y'all. They were, they were operating out of a code. I believe it's a code from heaven, not regional. So the question is, are we, are, are we a regional thing? Is, is this Bible only meant for Middle Eastern, you know, people, thinkers? Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're Americans. Is it a Jewish thing? Is it a, uh, it's a cultural thing? No, I believe it's a heaven thing. And we as believers can't, can't you know, avoid the most common uh, huma hum humanitarian reach outreach, and that's loving someone and giving them a glass of water. Or, or, or giving them clothing or giving them visits at the prison because that's what it's about. Notice God says in Matthew 25, because you did this to the least of these, you've done it unto me. In the most common, seemingly insignificant care for people, God elevated to a righteous, a very righteous and identifying place of honor. And I think it's sometimes we can think it's just a cultural thing. I, I'm still locked into my American culture. So this is how we do Christianity. No, it's not a regional Jewish thing. It's actually a heaven thing. I wrote this down. We follow a culture that is, is not restricted to space, time, or geography. Our culture is activated and maintained by the power of God's heart. Care for others is our on earth as it is in heaven, God culture expression. And it's not meant to be with just the hour and a half that we have together. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. Love you. Love you. Okay, that's over. We had a couple in the first service that when they first started coming here, they would look for people who they didn't know to have lunch with, going to brunch together. And uh, I think that's a great idea. What if you find someone in here you don't know? And you say, hey, you know, I don't know you. Why don't we have lunch together? Just don't say, you're paying, and I think you'll be in good shape. <laughs> now, the idea of getting someone in your space, that's, that's, a, that's, we, we, that's not what we've been trained to do. We've been trained to isolate. Christian isolation was never the heartbeat of God. Well, I got the truth, it's just me and mine. Some glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away. And all y'all going to hell, but I'm going to fly. That wasn't at all the heartbeat of God. Not remotely the heartbeat of God. But as you give someone a glass of water, as you're there for someone in the most common, seemingly insignificant, God says, that's my love. That's me. Jesus said that he never did anything outside of himself. He never just did it because he wanted to do whatever he did was ordained from the Father. In Luke 5:25, Jesus, um, I mean 5:27 through 32, he identifies a tax collector, the, the, the most uh, unloved people, the tax collectors by the Jews, because of their abuse in, in finances and stealing from their people. This guy was a Jew, but put under the, the rule of, of law from the, 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 the Romans, and he would cheat people out of their taxes. If they owed five, he would say, you owe 10 and keep the rest. This guy was a really tough dude. And, and Jesus walking by sees Levi, which will later be Matthew, and say, hey, listen, I want to I hang out with you. And the church people freaked out. The church, they, the, the religious people today couldn't handle it. They, you can't. You should not be doing that. You shouldn't be reaching out. But if Jesus did nothing except what his father told him, then that tells you that maybe the most unwanted people we're supposed to be reaching out to. Had a great situation happen on the internet. Some guy uh, wrote, a, wrote me an email. He said, I was watching early morning, Saturday morning uh, TV. I got up early and was slipping through the channels and came across your show. And then my, my remote broke. I couldn't get you off. It's like, <laughs> yeah. He said, I watched it. And I thought it was so intriguing because you didn't sound like anybody else I'd ever heard before. And it sounded different. And I said, and he wrote there, uh, you almost convinced me. <laughs> you know, out of Romans, it's a, or out of Acts, you almost convinced me. So I found that scripture and wrote the next one with that said, basically, you're the audience, audience I'm looking for. <laughs> you're the guy I'm looking for. And I told him, you're the guy I'm looking for, man. Just, uh, you know, next time, come on, uh, come on and see us. And it was neat to see this is why we're here to make a difference. We look different. We talk different. We're supposed to be different. And caring for another is the identifier of what we're about. They'll know you're my disciples because you're so smart. They'll know you're my disciples because you're so separate from you. You're isolate yourself. They'll know you're my disciples because your love one 
for another. It would have been a check mark for us for the box if it would have said, they'll know you're my disciples because you love God. Hallelujah. We all say, yes, we do. I hate people, but I love God. <laughs> and, and that's not what it says. They'll know you're my disciples because you're love one for another. We should be doing this better. So Jesus is reaching out to people that everyone's discarding. And 1 Peter 4, 9 is to be hospitable to one another without complaining or grumbling. Okay, I'll have somebody come to my house, but they'll get an hour. My show starts in about an hour. You got an hour? Okay, okay, see ya. That's not, that's, no, it's sacrificial. It's letting someone hang out. It's letting, it's being there for them. What do you think, church? I think this is Christianity 101. We, in Romans uh, 12, 5 through 10, he talks about the gifts. He says, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. He's talking about no, no, no one aspect is bigger than the other. No one uh, gift is bigger than the other. It's like we're all part of the body and it's all important. And he begins to explain these gifts that we've been given or that he's been given, uh, God gave to the body. He says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts of doing certain things things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. So we want you to prophesy. It's great. Verse 7 says, if, you, if your gift is serving, now, now notice this, prophecy we elevate, but sir, you have a gift to serve? Yes, that's part of the gift. Someone may have a gift to serve. If your gift is serving, serve them well. If you're, if you're a teacher, teach them well. See, we're the ones that elevate these things. God says these are all gifts and important to the body. For it to function right. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, uh, give generously. If God has given you your leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. If, you're, if your gift is to encourage, there's a scripture in, in 2 Corinthians that talks about the ministry of condemnation. Well, some of you have that gift already just by birth. And the idea, that's not, that's not a gift we want to we wanna cultivate. We've been free from the ministry of condemnation. You know, there are some people that say, hey, let me sign up for that. That's what I want, buddy. Show me where I sign up for the ministry of condemnation. Hallelujah. No. Ministry of reconciliation we've been all called to. And by the way, as I read these, don't just pretend to love others. Really, lo Now, Paul had to write that? Paul had to write that? Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. You know why? Because some people say, well, I'll try to love you. I'll, I'll have to fake so quit pretending. Don't pretend, he's saying. Don't be a poser. Don't be a guy that pretends. Hey, I love you, love you, love you, love you. Man, I can't believe that person came to church today. Hey, how you doing? Oh, I heard about you. Oh, my goodness. No, really, really love. Because you know why? God loved you. Someone took time for you. And, some, and that, that's a, man, praise God, somebody did. Someone took time for me. And this is how we work. This is how we work in the body of Christ. Now, when I read all these things, some of you guys were like doing a grocery list. Kindness, nah, don't really do that. No, uh, cheerful, no, don't. Giving, especially. Not gonna, oh, here we got one. Prophecy, hallelujah, that's what I want to. Oh, teaching, huh? oh, baby, that's where I want to be. Isn't that all about you? Did he just say that? I can't believe he did. <laughs> all these gifts are not to edify you. They're to edify the body. And everyone is vitally important. This is not a, like take a choice. This is really what God has imparted into you. And this is what I believe of all the gifts that we have. I believe that we have the Holy Spirit and we're complete in all things. And if the moment that you're in, the situation you're in, if there needs to be a prophetic word, the Holy Spirit can give you the prophetic word. And if it needs to be kindness, the Holy Spirit can give you the kindness to do it. You may have a propensity for one or the other, but I believe we are spirit led and God will pour into what's needed for the moment. Well, I'm not normally kind. See, I'm a Marine, so we gotta be kind of funny to be kind. I'll... No, we, no you're, you're of his, sorry, Jim. You're of his culture. <laughs> well, you know, that whole, that whole generosity thing, well, you know, it doesn't really fit my culture. What? Well, no, we have his culture. So all these things aren't options. They really are something that's been poured into you because you have the culture of God within you, the culture of spirit. This is what we live by. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in honor. Find a way to honor. Next verse, please. 
Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. This is not out of context as if saying, go work hard. No, he's saying work hard at all these things I just told you. And how do we work hard? We hang out with God and he pours it in. You already got it in you. How do you, I got to go work hard. No, is you rest in what's been poured into you and whatever's needed will be brought to you when you need it. Some of us aren't prophetic, like have a bent for that, but you've been used by God for a prophetic word. Come on, church. Isn't that right? Some of you might not be as kind as somebody else, but you operate in the gift of kindness when it was needed. Right? I hope so. Yeah. And some of us may have to work on a few things and ask, oh, Lord, give me the grace to love. Yeah, that's right. Now, will they'll be, here's the thing. There are goofy people in our, in our body. Not this body. I mean, oh, not this body specifically. <laughs> in the body of Christ. Not, not in the bridge. No. And God will give you the grace to look beyond the offense or the offensiveness or the goofiness and see the broken heart and see the wounded heart and, and realize why they're reacting and not responding, why pain seems to be their comfort. And you'll see what, how God sees them. Yet when they were sinners, Christ died for us. That's awesome. That's the heartbeat of our Father. This whole idea of, of doing it enthusiastically. And like I said, there in all these gifts that we have, it's not an option. If you follow him and you'll have all of the what you need at the time when you need it. Could we all be kind? Yes. We need to be work on. It. Yes. Do we all be encouraging? Yes. And there are some people that get that very naturally. And all of us maybe have to work on some things. The Holy Spirit will show you how. Just rest in him. What do you think, church? Yes. Amen. There's an old uh, Arab proverb that says, we have not talked, heart talk, until we've eaten together. This is not common in our culture. It's not common to, to get with everybody or get with somebody. But here's the thing. When you have lunch with somebody, it, it wasn't meant to be a McDonald's quick hamburger and you're out. It actually meant to spend time to know each other. Get to know that person. And as you get to know that person, this is what was supposed to happen. You really speak from heart to heart. You get beyond the little, you know, it's just kind of shallow end of the pool. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's with you and he'll bring you to places where you can actually minister one to another of the things of God. Because that's why God put you together to begin with. What do you think, church? So I want you to realize in the story of the, the, the guys, you know, going to Emmaus, they were rehearsing what went on that day and, and Jesus appears to them disguised and, uh, and it says that uh, they began to go over the things of the day. And he says, Jesus said, let me show you the Messiah in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, and the prophets. So as Jesus is walking with them, he's imparting all this wisdom and connecting the dots of the Old Testament and the prophets and who the Messiah was. And he's saying, and Jesus was that Messiah. And he's talking about himself. And the, the guys are going, oh, man, that is awesome wisdom and amazing revelation. Man, you're awesome. And, 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 and I, can you guys hang out with us a little longer, please? We'd love to have you with us a little longer, sir. Can you, can you have dinner with us? Can you have, would, you, would you mind, please, having dinner? And Jesus said, okay, you know, I, I was going this way, but I'll, I'll hang out with you. And so they sit down, and, and they have just heard from the greatest teacher on the planet, yet they have not recognized him, nor did Jesus reveal himself in the information. Jesus did not reveal who he was through the information about himself. But as they sat down and they broke bread, it's when he revealed himself. When you break bread with someone, when you share a meal, when you let someone in your house, that's what it means. It's not sharing a meal that we think, like we're going to go meet up here at, at Rib Crib and spend a, you know, about 30 minutes, 25, 40, whatever, and then we're out. No, it's actually spending time asking provoking questions, learning how to be a brother and sister in the Lord, learning how to love someone besides yourself. Breaking bread. The revelation of who Jesus was came at the breaking of bread, y'all. The revelation of what you have and what somebody else has about Jesus can be seen in the breaking of bread. We need to be caring one for another. In, uh, in, in Acts 2, 37 to 41, it, it lays out kind of what the church looked like. And I want to roughly go through that real quick. They said they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It says in verse 42, um, and that they, they, um, they grew. If you go to Acts, please. Acts 2, um, uh, 42, 
Yeah. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing in meals. Now notice, understanding what the what is the apostles' teaching is whatever Jesus taught. They continue steadfastly in the discussion of what Jesus taught. They would discuss it. They would think about it. And look what it led to. They, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. So it wasn't just head knowledge. It was just stuff to get up here and, and great revelation. It was actually expressed one to another. The revelation of Jesus, the beauty of his teaching cannot just be heady. It's meant to be heart to heart. It's meant to be shared. And truly, that's, the revel that's where the revelation of Jesus is best seen as you share it with somebody else. And they began to share meals. And the next verse, please. It says in, the, in verse 43, a deep sense of awe. Notice as they continued in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, that's where it really works. There was a great sense of awe. The Spirit of God was moving. And that's where the Spirit of God moves in relationship as you know each other. Uh, and there was miracles, performed miracles. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Now, I'm not saying we should create a commune, not remotely, uh, not going to do that, or that we should sell all that we have. And I just want you to realize this verse and the next verse, go to the next verse, please. Oh, they sold their properties and possessions and shared money with those in need. I'm not saying we do that either. I'm saying that you should be aware of people's needs. You should hang out with someone enough to say, because they may not need a check from you, but they sure would appreciate prayer. And the best thing we can pray for someone is not just the, that money fix. Maybe it needs to be a spiritual fix so the money fix will take care of itself. Maybe we should pray for favor and guidance and steps for our brother. And maybe we're standing in the gap for them. Now, he, it, it might be that he puts money, uh, something of a fix that you might have to do. That, that's possible because in this covenant, we're just conduits of his blessing. But you, a lot of times money isn't the fix. You being involved is the fix. You caring, you praying is the fix. I just want you to show you that they, they, they cared enough for each other and they knew when people were hurting and they knew when people needed something. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes in the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. With great joy and generosity. Well, Roland says we got to get people in our house. Okay, let's do it. Third. No, can't do it this week. Well, next week, nope. Okay, three weeks from now from 7 to 7.30. That works great for me. Now, with great joy and generosity, they open up their house. I, I know this is kind of, this is the culture of Christ. This is the culture of heaven. And all the while, praising God and enjoying goodwill with all people. This is what's so cool. All the things that we just said, they're operating under a different spirit. And that really is important to understand. Chapter 2 talks about the day of Pentecost. They're celebrating the day of Pentecost, the day that the law was given. But the Spirit of God also fell and supernaturally things were happening. And it's by the Spirit that all this was accomplished. You can't work backwards. You can't put all this stuff in action and hopefully it's going to work. No, it's because we're spirit people that this thing works. This is the expression of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of us being led by the Spirit. That's what the expression looks like. And this is, I love this, and all the while praising God. The Spirit of God leads you to a worship life, enjoying goodwill with people within the realm of our influence and out there too, oh, enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added their fellowship, those who are being saved. So we're not only impactful here with each other, we're impacting a community. People, they appreciate the fact there's a church that actually does things and says what they're going to do and they do what, they said, what, they're gonna, what they've said, that they actually believe in something. That's what God has, has, has uh, called us to do. And so this is, this, this is all really cool. And what happens is we'll read verse you know, 40, 32 or 42 to, 30 to 47, and we think, well, let's start implementing. Well, no, it's by the Spirit. That's the expression. And we are people of Spirit. I want you to go back. Look, look, look at Peter, man. Peter said, now, Peter, this is important to understand. At the beginning of this chapter, the Holy Spirit falls supernaturally, wind, tongues, all that, and they begin to, to speak in tongues, and, and something amazing happens. Peter gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, Peter starts making sense. <laughs> yeah, that's, I know, it's a miracle, right? That's what I'm saying. All of a sudden, there's a situation. Everyone's got to misunderstand what's going on, and Peter goes, someone needs to say something. Well, that in itself was a miracle that people would say, Peter would think, I, I, you know, he would just step out sometimes. Well, now, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, he says something that's so absolutely cool and magnificent that it brings people to a heart place. And they say Peter's word pierced their heart, and they said to him, 
and the others, apostles, brothers, what should we do? And saying, how can we be saved? They, they, were, they were righteous men before. They were devout Jews. They, had, they, had, they were worshiping type and shadows. And all of a sudden, Peter brings this argument to a close. And they're saying, we must know. What do we do to, to know this Messiah? This is the, the moving of the Holy Spirit. As you're led by the Spirit, as, as you're guided, you can speak words that just don't you know, in, deal with the intellect, but actually go to the heart. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to show that you have been received forgiveness for your sins. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what's, what he's saying. What you've done so far is, is, is righteous. You, you're trying to follow a law, and that's all good. Now, instead of just typing shadows, we have the Messiah. His name is Jesus. So you must be baptized, not into rules and regulations of the law. You must be baptized in the Spirit in Jesus Christ. And when you're baptized in the Spirit, then all of a sudden, you're not trying to live the law. The law's in your heart, and you live it. And you've been, you've been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. And it's not you trying to maintain, it's you resting in the accomplished work of Jesus. That's what baptism in Jesus looks like. And, and you have to understand the difference between the processes of, of Jewish faith that, that were so beautiful in explaining the Messiah. Well, the Messiah has come. He's fulfilled the law, and we're baptized in Christ by the Spirit. And I want you to see what spirit it is. If you look at verse 11 of Acts 2, if you go to Acts 2, 11, it says that, that the Spirit of God fell, and they were speaking in tongues, and they were all speaking in their own language. And then it said that uh, we hear them speak something and in our language. And you got to remember, in, in this, the, even the most a uh, foreign dialect, we hear them speaking this. And look, now what would, from heaven, what would be the words they would hear? What, what would you think would be the, the right words to hear that all these people would hear? Look what it says, Cretes and Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speak in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. We live our lives expressing the wonderful works of God. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was never meant to be an event. It was meant to be a life change. It was meant to be part of the life change. And that when you walk in every sphere of influence that you walk in, every language of influence that you walk in, that they see the Spirit of God in you and they hear and see the wonderful works of God. It's by the Spirit and it's how we touch lives. And this is something that I believe the church has been called to do. And we at the bridge want to do this well. And I know uh, I, I love the beauty of his word. I love the beauty of theology and some great stuff, but it has to work somewhere and it works in everyday life in the most common everyday care. And so we started something here at the bridge and because we needed to, we were, we were dropping the ball in certain areas. And so uh, we, we came up with a first responder uh, group and it basically is caring for our body. And Kim's going to kind of share with you um, what this looks like and what it is. Would you please welcome Kim, my beautiful wife, <laughs> Pastor Kim. You know, back in the day, um, back in the day, like years and years ago, uh, when a family needed something, it was typically a meal. And many women did not work outside of the home, so to prepare a meal for another family was not really a big deal. Well, you fast forward to today, and the 2018 family looks a little different. We've got everything from two-income families to single parents, often with kids that are involved in extracurricular activities, sports. And so the needs have changed as well. And so we want to meet those needs. Many of you have uh, been recipients of meals or different things, and um, that's awesome. It's great. But then there's been some that have kind of fallen in the cracks because we just did not have the resources to provide. And that really hurts my heart. I really don't like that. And so we've been actually contemplating this. It's been percolating, this whole idea for about the last three or four months, and not knowing kind of the direction of what his series was going to be, then when it all came together and just fit so beautifully hand in hand, that we thought this is a great time to present this to the church. So we're calling it first responders. Now when you think of a first responder, this is more what you think about. A person with specialized training who is among the first to arrive and aid at the scene of an emergency. And so you've got your police, your fire, your, your medical, sometimes your military. So that's not what we're talking about. 
But a bridge first responder looks more like this. Just everyday people, you and me, persons desiring to be the hands and feet of Jesus among the first to meet a bridge member's natural need, sometimes in an emergency. So our vision is very basic, and that is meet the needs of our people. We do this through five different areas that we're focusing on, the first one being meals, and that's typically the first thing that a family in need is desiring. Um, we've got someone who's going to be overseeing that. We also uh, have visitation. So maybe you can't take a meal, um, but you, you have the gift of gab, and you like to, uh, that wasn't really scriptural. But, no, but yeah. <laughs> Let's say, babe. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe they just kind of forgot to mention that. Um, but I've actually had people tell me I had the gift of gab. <laughs> and I will go and visit with someone, and I'll pray over them and encourage them. And it's like, sometimes that's all that's needed, and that's wonderful. Uh, we have three that are going to be more on an assessment type situation, and that is house cleaning, yard work, and minor home repair. So what it doesn't look like is, I'm so tired, I've worked all week, I need someone to come clean my house. Or I need my kitchen completely remodeled. That's not what we're talking about. But there are those that find themselves in different situations and different circumstances that this is just something that they're desperately needing. And we want to be there. We want to meet that need. So we're inviting men and women to be a part of this. The scripture that Orlando has been referring to in Matthew 25 about how, when was I in prison? When were you in prison that we visited you? When were you hungry and that we fed you? That has, I've really been mulling that over and meditating on that so much over the last couple of months because that's what this is all about. If we... And I don't want to re-preach your whole sermon. Good. But if we, <laughs> and everyone says that, but, but it is that thing of, yes, I have all this knowledge, but if I do nothing with it, then I don't know. And, to, and they say it's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, that can be debatable because the people who are receiving this are extremely blessed. But to be able to go and minister to someone in that way is also incredibly blessed. So we're giving you this opportunity to fulfill Matthew 25, and we're family, and family lets family members know what we need, and what we need are team members. We've got people that are going to head up these areas, but we need people to be a part and join with us in that. Now, par for the course, we can sometimes go months without needing anything. No meals, no visitation, nothing. Everybody's healthy, happy, wealthy, everything. But then, like the saying goes, when it rains, it pours. And we may have four or five needs just in a matter of two weeks. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now in our body. And we just don't have the resources to meet all those needs. Often these little acts will impact someone's life in a way that you'll never know. So Orlando has a try it for a week. So I have a think about it forever. <laughs> and my think about it is kind of something he said last week. But it is the common in your life can be the spectacular in someone else's. So the little common things that you think are maybe a little insignificant can be the spectacular in someone. So I'm going to be out in the lobby after service. If you have any questions, if you'd like to sign up, just come see me in the lobby. Good. Thank you. Thank you. We want to make a difference in people's lives and sometimes just being there for them makes it happen. That's probably the most spiritual thing you can ever do is going over and just hanging out with someone who has been, who's lost hope. So that's what we want to do. So I leave you with a tiff, a try for a week. Besides try for forever. Uh, I choose to be a first responder in expressing the wonderful works of God. The kingdom of God is revealed through fellowship and care for others. And the impact is a visible representation of our heaven on earth culture. It really was heaven on earth, care for one another in the common, not the spectacular. So I'm praying that uh, that moves our heart. That's kind of like 101 Christianity, but maybe we want to do this really well. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I just love you. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the word that is spoken by the Spirit to your people. And I pray right now, God, that people respond to you, Holy Spirit, and that the word spoken would go to the very heartbeat of the need that they have. 
and that by the Spirit you would meet every single need today. We thank you that we are the healed, the blessed, the delivered, the set free of the Lord. But there may be some who have never received Jesus. So I want us all to pray the prayer of receiving Jesus as Lord of our life. If you repeat after me, Father, I call you my Father. Thank you for Jesus. I receive him as Lord of my life. My sins are forgiven. My past is forgotten. I belong to you, Father, and you belong to me. I'm your child, and you're my Father, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.